Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. In this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome back Judith Curry. She has been on the podcast before. It was October of 2020. She is the president of Climate Forecast Applications Network. Uh, Judy, welcome back to the Power Hungry Podcast. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. I warned you, guests introduce themselves. Now, I know you've been on the podcast before, but imagine you've arrived somewhere you don't know anyone. You have about a minute to introduce yourself. Go. Okay. I spent, you know, I'm trained as a geoscientist and I've spent most of my academic career researching climate related topics. Um, most recently in academia, I was chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech for 13 years. Um, I retired from academia in 2017. Since then, I've been focused on my company, which is Climate Forecast Applications Network, and also um, writing a book, um, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, trying to wrap my head around the whole thing. Okay, good. And I saw in your bio, you're a grandmother. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. How many? Okay. Well, let's a very this, proud one. <laughs> okay. Well, tell us about your kids before we your grandkids before you go on. Who? Uh, okay. Okay. Well, well, my my granddaughter lives in Reno, where I am living, which is why we moved to Reno, and she's in seventh grade, very bright and just just a wonderful kid. And I also have a number of step grandchildren, also, and they live in um, Colorado. Gotcha. So, yeah. So well, I I ask about the grandmother because you referenced this in one of your recent yeah. postings on your I, website. You know, like an, <laughs> you know, and the the age thing is relevant for a couple of reasons. Um, first, the only people who can afford to speak out against the establishment and climate consensus are the people who are retired and whose <laughs> academic income or reputation doesn't rely on the approval of their activist peers. And also with age comes a different kind of wisdom in terms of being able to reflect more broadly uh, on things rather than as young scientists, you know, everyone's focused in these very narrow silos. So I think age provides some really different perspectives and some changing values even. So well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I, I, I think if I looked at my guest list on the podcast, it definitely skews older. And I'm of the same mind in terms of particularly around grid and power issues that I want to talk to people with gray hair because they've been around and know, have some experience. So uh, I think if I'm, are you 68 or 69, if your Wikipedia is correct? Um, I'm in spitting distance of 70 in a few months. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you were on the podcast now more than two years ago and a little more than two years ago. And as I said, before we started recording, I don't, I don't want to dig too deep into this, the climate science stuff, uh, you know, in terms of forcings and the rest of it. But I, I want to ask, this was the question I, uh, more than any other, I thought I wanted to put to you, you know, right off the bat, what's changed in the last couple of years has, I mean, there's a lot of, still a lot of activism around trying to reduce emissions, or we've had another COP meeting, which I want to talk about COP27. How, in your view, given your perspective over the last couple of years, how have things changed in terms of our debate around climate and energy policy? Okay, think back like seven years ago, five years ago, the activists were Greenpeace, um, environmental defense, um, Sierra Club, and stuff like that. And in hindsight, I mean, those seem like totally sane organizations. Okay, now we've got Extinction Rebellion and Stop Oil Now with massive infusions of money. I mean, this is coming from the Gettys and the Rockefellers and even the Kennedys. I mean, these are people throwing money. And, and these are the like insane, you know, throwing tomato soup you know, at Van Gogh, at, at Masterpiece and gluing themselves and blocking bridges and doing all this crazy stuff. Um, so, so the whole, what I would say, the activist wing of all this has gone way off the deep end, has gone way off the deep end. Um, the other thing that's going on is um, there's a lot of propaganda out there that is aimed at kids, 
okay, two, two things going on. You know, decades ago, people figured out, well, we have to start young so by, that by the time they're adults, they understand. But then they realize that the kids can be effective at convincing their parents. Well, the byproduct of all this is that we have a lot of suicidal, depressed, and whatever kids who are not coping. You know, they, they think they have no future. Uh, I mean, there's a, a book, um, I can't remember the exact title, but it's Greta Thunberg's World. Right. It's aimed at ages three to eight. Greta thinks she might not have a future because of climate change. So why should she go to school? You know, this is a kind of message that's being you know, fed to young children. So, and, if, so if I can interrupt, what you're saying is that you, from over the last five years, and I think that's right, I think it's a correct assessment that the uh, climate activism has become more radicalized and aimed at younger and younger people. Is that, a, is right, that what I'm yes, hearing you say? Yes, yes, exactly. And there's all these lawsuits, you know, our children's trust is basically using kids to sue the U.S. government, every state in the union. Now they've gone international you know, doing lawsuits. And, and, and then the, the, the kicker is that they play, a, play off the psychological injuries that the children are suffering from climate change. And it's not real injuries, it's pre, pre-traumatic stress syndrome. They're worried about the future because of all the junk and garbage they fed. they've been fed. You know, so, so, I mean, you come full circle with this stuff. And I've never heard that pre-traumatic stress syndrome. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That th this is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a it's a real issue. Like like in the military, let's let's say a guy is in the army and he's headed towards the front lines. I mean, he might be anxious about what's going to happen and sure. whatever, and it might really affect him badly. Okay, so that's real pre-traumatic stress. This other stuff is just this vague nonsense and apocalyptic rhetoric that goes way beyond anything that adults are fed, which goes way beyond anything that is actually consistent with the IPCC reports. And so we just have this absolute craziness, just absolute craziness. And it's being, yeah, I, I'm I'm deep into this issue at the moment, which is why I'm talking about it. <laughs> sure. Um, and is this you know, part of the focus of your new book, which you, you said was climate uncertainty and risk is your title? Yeah. I, I don't even know that that particular issue is even mentioned in my book. Um, but it, it's, again, I'm, I'm working on something for a client right now on that topic. And I've even done a recent blog post. Um, on the topic, this whole pre-traumatic stress syndrome and all the garbage that's polluting the children's mind and scaring them. And I can relate to this because, you know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. Remember the communists and all that? Oh, sure. Um, so I was raised as a Catholic. And when I went to my weekly catechism or whatever, the nun would feed us all this stuff about the Russians. They've infiltrated, they're taking it over, you know, there's going to be nuclear bombs and on and on and all this. And I got genuinely freaked out. You know, I was very worried every time my dad was late coming home from the office, you know, I'd be looking out the window, did the Russians get him? You know, on and on it went. And at the ripe old age of a third grader, I had an ulcer. Okay, so I, I see how this can happen. Wow. Okay, so I, I see. So, uh, you know, I think this stuff is real. I think the kids are suffering real psychological injuries, but it's caused by all this nutty apocalyptic propaganda. You know, and like, what but, are so, we doing? So let me, let me, propaganda is a powerful word. And I think in some cases it applies in terms of some of the, the claims around the energy transition. And I've used that, that line myself <laughs> that, that, oh, we'll, we'll just switch to something else. When in fact, because of the scale of the network and the scale of the challenge of our energy and power networks, how big they are, we're not going to make some quick pivot to EVs or wind turbines or whatever, whatever it is. But you, since you brought this up, you've become, have you, well, I'll ask it this way. You've been outside of academia, and, and I think you were a, a attacked by a lot of different people for your views, of, which are, are outside of the orthodoxy, about outside of the cat catastrophist orthodoxy, I'll put it that way. Yeah. Have you become more comfortable with it? I mean, maybe with time, with age, you mentioned age earlier. 
but you still, the way you were talking about it, it seems like it's still just, uh, as my late brother John said, grills your cheese or just, just still, it, well, it makes you mad. You know, when I was in academia, even though I started speaking out while I was still a faculty member, I still had to pull my punches. I had to reflect on this, that, and the other and consider this, that, and the other. And I decided <clears throat> I don't want to operate that way. I mean, that's antithetical to science. You know, I want to be able to pursue what I want to pursue. I want to be able to say what I want to be able to say. And I want to engage much more broadly, not just within the narrow confines of my discipline for which, you know, I am professionally evaluated on. So it just, you know, apart from all the grief that I received, it just made no sense to me, you know, to, to stay in that environment. So, um, you know, I... I'm not a partisan on either side. I, you know, I don't have a group that I belong to. I just call it like I see it. I investigate a range of topics driven by what my clients hire me to do or where my personal interest leads me. Okay. And I write about some of that on the blog. A lot of it's in my new book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. And a lot of it is some new issues like this one about the brainwashing of the kids. I mean, this is one that disturbs me greatly. Um, so, so, so that's where I'm at. And, and, I, and I work with a lot of utility companies, you know, the clients of my company. I have a number of clients, even more broadly in the energy sector. So I'm pretty up to date on what's going on. And, you know, you've got people like Mark Jacobson pushing, you know, for the 100% renewables, whatever. And I have a model, you know, these toy models. And, and, and then he criticizes anybody. Well, where's your publication? I said, well, excuse me. There are thousands of engineers in electric utility companies that have operational expertise on this. Okay. They, they know what's going on. They know what can work. They know what can't work. Okay, and he's saying, well, that's inferior to his model because he has a peer-reviewed publication. I mean, you know, that to me, that's very reflective of how insane <laughs> academia has become and how detached from the real world. You know, it's all become a game. Oh, but I have so many publications and so many citations and a press release and whatever, but it's completely not detached. useful and right. counter useful relative to you know the real world so it's it's and really that, become detached from reality that's that that rhymes with my view as well and and uh, it confirms my feeling about it that there are these elaborate models and these you know elite academics from elite universities and they're putting together these models and i've had one of them on as a guest on the podcast but they have no relation to the physical world and that they've never built these projects. And I'm looking at it primarily, you know, well, from one of the many vantage points, but the land use conflicts, and that's never even okay. considered. Of course, oh, well, we'll build all this high voltage transmission. And I look at these okay. press releases and I think, oh, you will, will you? Okay. <laughs> well, here's the funny thing. The heritage environmental advocacy groups, you know, the, the Greenpeace, that kind of stuff, they're the ones who are fighting against the transmission lines and installations of wind turbines because of ecosystem impacts. Right. Okay. And, and they were, they played a big role in stopping the hydropower uh, transport from Canada into new England. Right. So, so, so the heritage environmental groups have become detached from the <laughs> extreme climate activists. You know, in I mean that that's a pretty interesting phenomena, really. Well, sure, uh, yeah, and well, yeah, and a lot of different interest groups who have interest yeah. in their neighborhoods and you, the state of New Hampshire blocking that project that was going to take uh, Quebec hydro hydropower into Massachusetts, saying, "Well, we're not going to let you build a power line through the White Mountains here. This is our this is our our state. Forget about it." Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's back up for just a minute. So, how's business? Uh, you started Climate Forecast Application Network. Uh, what? four or five years ago now, something like that? No, it, it, oh, no, it was founded in 2006, oh, okay. you know, and it, and it was launched as like a, a Georgia tech venture lab startup, you know, kind of thing. And we, and our early, okay. Our first client, this was a humanitarian project in Bangladesh to forecast floods. 
um, so people could evacuate earlier and save their seeds and their livestock and whatever. And then the second one was a client was a petroleum company. And this was after Hurricane Katrina and all the catastrophe for the oil companies in the Gulf. And they wanted longer range forecasts than what they were getting from the National Hurricane Center. A, they needed more warning and B, they wanted to make money on natural gas trading and stuff like that. And so that was the second client. Okay. So two very different um user spaces. Right. And, and and this was during a period when I was you know, parroting the party line about global warming. Okay. I think at one time I even joked that the profits from my oil company grant was helping subsidize the humanitarian work in Bangladesh. And, and so people think that's when I came under the evil influence of big oil. Well, that's not how it played out. I was doing hurricane forecasts for them, basically. Um, so what I would call the weather forecast side of my company sort of ramped up over the decade, you know, temperatures, you know, demand, a lot of it was energy related. We moved into the insurance sector. They got, they were very interested in the hurricane stuff. Wind power is a big one now. And so there's the weather forecasting side of what we do. And we emphasize the longer range, you know, what happens beyond five days, I mean, people mostly get it right, you know, but, you know, we're, we're looking out weeks two, three, four and providing insights that are better than anybody else, as far as I can tell, which is why the what, why our clients pay us. Um, so can you give me an idea in terms of revenue, employees, any of those numbers that um, will put you in small context? Company, small company. Okay. Um, and, and it's a little bit hard to count on employees because... Some of them are part-time. Some of them are in other countries. What are, I would say maybe 12 FTE employees, uh, many of them outside the U.S. Many of them are contractors rather than W-2 employees. Um, revenue is in seven figures. Um, you know, we're, we're not huge, but, you know, we're very stable and viable um, on the my goal isn't to make money. It's a nice side effect, but I'm trying to figure out better ways to use weather and climate information to help people manage risk. So we do a lot of R and D. Okay. And so if I, have, I could, so if I could interrupt, so a, a, an applicant or one of your customers would be heating degree. Uh, my first book was on Enron back 20 some odd years ago now, sure, um, yeah. heating, de heating degree days, right? This is one of the main things. Sure. So they're, uh, they're going to look to you for help on weather forecasting so they can be long or short gas power or, or exactly. coal or exactly. whatever. So, <laughs> and that's of high value return for them because you're able to give them pretty accurate data for what you're forecasting in terms of weather. Absolutely. And I have clients on the uh, coast, electric utilities, who highly value the hurricane forecasts. And one of them, um, we, we've developed a lot of customized products for them. And our forecasts feed into their outage models. And, you know, they use this to plan in advance how many mutual aid people they need to bring in and where to position, you know, their mobile repair units and on and on it goes. So, um, you know, it's helping um, reduce power outages, you know, our forecast very directly. Oh, that's uh, really, that's really interesting because this resilience issue is one that I've been paying a lot of attention to. And a lot of people in the utility sector are very concerned about availability of transformers, wires, all these things that are, you know, the commodities that they need if you have damaged facilities that they can come in and replace them. So that's, I didn't realize that that, that would be and part they of want it. seasonal forecasts from us also, you know, hurricanes, you know, it's a little bit, that's more voodoo like, but so they can plan as to, you know, what kind of equipment they need to have on hand and how much of their budget they might have to allocate, you know, is it going to be an active or a quiet season? Awesome. Um, you know, so so I'm on the ground, you know, working with these people who are on the front lines of dealing with these issues. And to, to say that I haven't published on, you know, renewable energy or whatever completely misses the point, you know, that I have operational knowledge about 
what's going on with these utility companies as they grapple with extreme weather and the variability and the variability of you know of the renewables i mean once you get past a certain penetration it it just becomes very very difficult to handle and you know you, you, you people have these statistics and the 1 in 10 rule and all this kind of stuff but at the end of the day you can be hit with these crazy um, outages that will <clears throat> One of my clients, you know, who works in Texas, um, he wrote a, an anonymous guest post on my blog about the period between this year, between mid-August and late September, when there was no wind or solar. I mean, just nothing. I mean, not only was it quiet, but it was also cloudy, <laughs> you know, and there was just nothing coming from the renewables. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, the temperatures were over 100. It wasn't a crazy heat wave, but it was still plenty hot. Well, I, yeah, I that, read that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I read that that was from Energy Meteorologist, I guess. That was about ERCOT. By I Energy Meteor. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, a, he's a guy who works in this space, you know, is intimately involved in what goes on <clears throat> with ERCOT. He works for a company that owns power plants, conventional and... Um, renewable and does energy trading and stuff like that. So he's on the front lines of all this, um, you know, and, and that kind of, I mean, it was unusual, but that kind of thing is never factored in to like the Mark Jacobson kind of analyses. And this idea that, oh, well, if you have, you know, this gl fancy global transmission grid, you know, if it's not, the wind isn't blowing here, it's going to be blowing over there and you just transmit it. But these big high pressure systems, I mean, they're continental in scale, right? You know, that give you the low winds. And especially during winter, there's no solar, there's hydropower is at a minimum, you know, <laughs> like wh where, where is this going to come from? <laughs> you know, the transmission lines just don't help under these continental scale weather systems. And, you know, this kind of stuff just isn't factored into all these models of the 100% renewable system. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that is one of the key takeaways in, and I've reported on it in uh, regarding the outages here in ERCOT. And I live in Austin, of course, but yeah, the, that this, the, the, there was a wind and solar drought in the, in the, in the days leading up to winter storm Uri, but I, I'll bring it up even to today and today's December 12th, uh, Javier Bloss from Bloomberg reported yesterday in, on Twitter. He said that I'm going to read it here. UK wholesale electricity prices surged to a record high as cold, dry, and calm weather cripples wind production and sends demand soaring. So I written. know I've been following that closely. I've been collecting all these all these articles of what's going on this winter. I mean, th this is not a good thing. And, and you winter know, hasn't even started yet. I mean, we're, we're, we're it, nine days away from the beginning, the official start of winter, and well, here. You, you Meteorological just... winter is really December one, but yeah, and some some years December is worse than February. But you know, there's a lot of variability, and this is not adequately accounted for. And even if you look at the statistics for the last ten or thirty years, you can still get a surprise that goes beyond that envelope. And the surprises are invariably on the cold side. I mean, the electric utilities worry a lot more about cold because. What can happen is, you know, really unbounded, you know, on the high side, you know, oh, it's going to be over 100, 105, 100, you know, it, there's sort of bounds. But on the cold side, it's pretty much, you know, the surprises can be of much greater magnitude. And the utility companies, even in the southeast, are more worried about the cold extremes than the heat extremes. Well, I, I think that it, I, I think it was my friend Meredith Angwin. She was pointing this out to me that the temperature differentials in the summer, uh, you know, if we think 72 is the ideal, right, where we're really comfy, right? My room is something right. like that now, right? Well, in the summer, it might get to 100 or 110. Okay, so we'll call that a difference of 30 or 40 degrees. But in the winter, it can be a difference of 70 yeah. degrees, 70 exactly. or 80 degrees if you're below zero, right? And using the Fahrenheit exactly. scale. Exactly. But, but I hadn't thought it, that's a very simple way to think about it, but it's one that I, you know, when she said it, I thought, oh, well, duh, right, Bryce, why didn't you think of this before? Right. But that's a greater, it's a bigger gap that has to be filled with other energy to make us stay in a comfortable range. And, and I thought that was a very good insight. But if you don't mind, I want to, I want to reach back uh, to 
these ideas around belief, because I was interested, you know, I was raised Catholic as well. And this idea about belief in, you know, well, here's the short question. I won't get, I won't make the preface any longer. I'm, I know we're talking about climate and this is your expertise, but what makes us believe what we believe? I mean, this is where you've been, you've, you've, you had a long tenure in academia. You had, you know, conflict there. What do you think? What do you think about that? Why do we believe what we believe? Okay, well, I'll narrow the focus of the question sure. down to something that I have been thinking about and section 10.1 in my forthcoming book, and this is perception of risk. Mm. Okay, and, and this is what's really germane to what we're talking about. And I wish I would have prepared for this a little bit so I had more of the details, you know, at the tip of no, my tongue. No, that's but basically, okay. you, you go ahead, you don't know. But, no okay, th there's certain things like I mean, the whole world is, you know, gripped by global warming is the biggest risk facing the world and whatever. And even individual kids are worried about it when the real risk that they're the biggest risk they're facing to their life is probably being riding their bicycle and being hit by a car. <laughs> OK, you know, that's the biggest risk. And they don't even think about that one. So, so I, I mean, like the dread of nuclear power. Um, is completely, I mean, way more people have died from installing wind turbines and <laughs> stuff like that than sure. have uh, been killed in any kind of nuclear power plant issue. So, so right. our perceptions of risk, and, and it's certain things. And Slovak, when people have done research, psychologists have, have done research on how we perceive risk. So if it's man made, versus natural, the man-made risk is perceived as much worse. So if we were talking about mm -hmm. another degree of warming in the 21st century, and it was going to be natural, you know, people wouldn't worry about it. But man-made, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, if it's something that we can control versus something we can't control, you know, a volcanic eruption being the latter, you know, we tend not to worry about the stuff we can't control. And, and there's all these other things that there, there's a list of 10 different things like that, that I'm only remembering two off the top of my head. But, oh, in a, in a recent experience, like living where a hurricane struck, Right, you know, skews your perception about the future of the hurricane risk. You know, even though it's like a once in a century event or something, you know, the odds of it striking in it, you know, but it, it really bumps up um, your so fear. So the, the, the perception. So some of that is about the perception of risk. But it, the follow-on yeah. question I had to that because uh, I see propaganda. The propagandists use this. Okay, why they emphasize extreme weather events. Okay, they emphasize the human component of climate change, not the, the man-made one. They, they emphasize the things that trigger the misperception of risk. Okay, and they do that in their communications. Okay, so, so, so this is how we're being influenced. Okay, the, by people not understanding or having an object, being able to objectively assess their risk. And this is basically what my book is all about. You know, we, we've portrayed, we, we've 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 really assessed the climate risk inappropriately. We've misportrayed it. We've miscommunicated. And and the reason people are bumping up the alarm and the ap apocalyptic rhetoric is to spur immediate action on this transition to renewables. Uh, which does not give a, you know, and if you lose the urgency, you know, then you have time and space to figure out, well, what do we really want to do, you know, with the power system for the 21st century? Can we do better than we're doing now? Probably. Um, can we so, continue? So, so what I yeah. hear you saying is that we're by this skewing of the perception of risk, we're making malinvestment. We're we're we're, oh, yeah. we're rushing, you know, and and we're doing more harm than good because I mean that there's no way that the whole world can run on wind and solar. There's just no apart from land use. Uh, the, the the resources, 
on and on it goes. When th these things, the, the, the economics don't work. I mean, these things have to be replaced every 15 years. Um, you, you know, the, eco the, the way they've done the economics just totally doesn't make sense. Um, the environmental impacts of all the used and the recycling of the material, you know, there's just no way. It's so material intensive. The supply chain doesn't exist. And then what do we do with all the other stuff once it's past its lifetime? That There's just no way it makes sense, either from a materials or a land use or an economic, you know. But, but there's other things out there. I mean, I think that the next generation nuclear power, there's so many advances that are amazingly exciting. And some of these things are starting to come online. Uh, advanced geothermal looks very cool in many regions. And my state of Nevada is looking at a new investment in geothermal. Nevada is a great place for geothermal. So, you know, th there are things that can be coming down the pike. And if we're not rushing to install wind turbines and whatever, you know, we can invest our money in developing these technologies, doing, you know, small local experiments experiments to see how they work, you know, get a learning curve going. And then, you know, by 2080, we're in a pretty good place, you know, with really reliable um, power sources, cleaner, more abundant and whatever, rather than this mess with renew with wind and solar that, you know, just aren't going to work. I mean, biomass is a disaster. I don't think we need to go there. Hydropower is pretty much built out, although there are some things you can do with pumped hydro storage that the U.S. is doing, but it's not done in a lot of other places. So, so sure. there is, you know, something, some more you can do with hydro, but I mean, rooftop yeah. solar is an okay so I have rooftop solar and I do it for energy security. Right. I have two Tesla power walls, you know, so when the power goes out, you know, I've got something. Um, although I've been electrifying, but when I installed the solar panels, since I installed the solar panels, I added two electric water heaters, um, one electric heat pump, and an electric induction stove. I'm now, <laughs> the solar power is now, and, and we have an electric vehicle. So, so the solar panels are now only producing half of our electric usage <laughs> relative to when I purchased it. So because you've uh, ramped up your, this is, the electrification yeah, in your I home. mean, I'm, in, I'm interested in the technologies. I mean, I want gas out of the house just for air quality issues and, you know, mm. the, nitric oxide and carbon monoxide and whatever. I just didn't want gas in the house for that reason. So, and I, regarding the car, it wasn't my choice with my husband's, you know, we just wanted to try the technology. We're in this space. We need to be knowledgeable of these technologies. Okay. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty close. I still have a gas clothes dryer <laughs> and one gas furnace, but other than that, I'm almost completely electrified, but, um, and Nevada has pretty clean electricity source. Right. So, but but I see the drain that adding all this stuff does to the electricity plot. You know, if we doubled the electricity use, <laughs> you know, by households all doing what I've done, I mean, whoa, it would have that, a big that, well, that's yeah, an I mean, issue. Yeah, that's huge. An issue. And 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 then and that peak would come in the winter time, which you which just discussed is key because the. Uh, um, yeah. I've I've written about this that the 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 amount of of gas delivered on a on a per BTU basis or joule basis during the winter is far greater than the electricity delivered during the summer in the for, to support air conditioning. So that's a, okay. that's an interesting point. But I just want to reach reach back if I could to the issues around belief because you've you've given it some 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 thought and that the. Um, well, I'll ask it very directly. Has the has belief in catastrophic climate change then supplanted for many people, and it's not everyone, right? Traditional religious belief, right? Because I see a lot of parallels, and you're you know we're both raised Christian about this idea about damnation and sin, and we have to pay, and you know these ideas around uh, redemption. Does that ring true to you? Or has, um, has, well, has it, this it, catastrophism you know, um, around climate is that replaced traditional religion for for a lot of people? I don't know that it's replaced. I mean, I think the decline in traditional religion has happened, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> long before this. Yeah. And people have supplanted it with various secular 
you know, environmentalism broadly defined, I think is, you know, maybe one uh, with climate change being its most recent incarnation. So I think it's probably part of a, a broader environmentalism belief system kind of thing that is part of, but, but, um, as yeah, a more secular so it, as a more secular church of some of, of yeah the, oh, of oh yeah system. and and, and the, the wars that you know the the her- heretic and dogma and, and all of this stuff and cancel culture of heretical people and whatever the the, the alarmists are being are behaving like high priests in some very <laughs> strict religion um, so a lot of that's you know enforced by the leaders. The either you know the people with a big megaphone or big bucks behind them or whatever um some are politicians some are scientists some are in the media and some are in these crazy new environmental uh, climate activist groups you know extinction rebellion and so on right i mean I so laugh because i thought okay so if i was listening to this and i didn't know yet well there's a cranky old grandma you know, you know, and I'm laughing because I want to laugh about it, but do, do you ever think about that? Well, I'm, because I'm cranky, I'm old and grumpy now, but you ever worry that that's the kind of the thing that you, that vibe that you would be painted with that brush, I guess. Well, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I was here, you know, back when I started speaking out, against the consensus and this would be cir- circa 2010 and this is long before anybody called me a denier or there was any real scientific agree you know disagreement but scientific american did a big profile on me and i was explaining the concerns i have about what we don't know and how the community of climate scientists is behaving it was a lengthy interview they a two hour photo shoot with, you know, makeup and the whole works. I thought, wow, you know, this could be a really good article. The title of the article, climate heretic, Judith Curry turns on her colleagues. I mean, this was the big takeaway (laughs) from this big interview Um, just because I wasn't, you know, bowing down to the tribal leaders and trying to make myself a member of the tribe you know i was just as some awful person you know and and that triggered you know like this is dogma you know if what i'm doing is heresy you know all the, this has really become dogma and of course you know a year or two later then after i criticized michael mann and his hockey stick then i became a denier so that, that was the threshold for me becoming a denier. It was basically criticizing the hockey stick. Um, you, you know, so so the whole, I mean, not all climate scientists are like that, but a lot of the most vocal ones are the ones with 200,000 Twitter followers and the ones who hire publicity agents to get themselves on all the, you know, mainstream media, TV shows and whatever. I mean, th- that isn't science. I mean, they're, they've just become co-opted into the propaganda machine with great professional rewards. I mean, not only do they make money off of this, but they're given, you know, recognition from the professional scientists. You know, that that's, oh, wow, he's doing something good. He's doing something important. You know, so, I mean... At some point, academia just made no sense. It was bad when I left. In 2017, it is way worse now. Three years later, the the orthodoxy is much more strict around these issues. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's big money. Everybody. I mean, there is no climate scientist out there right now who can't find a job. I mean, universe. So much research. Oh, we're hired. We're starting a new center. We're starting a new program. We're advertising for ten faculty members. The private sector is hiring in this area left and right. Nobody you know, who is a climate scientist is sitting there unemployed right now when 10 years ago, you know, people were struggling from postdoc to postdoc, you know, trying to get something going. Now everybody's. There's plenty of money. Climate scientists are hot commodities. Yeah. Right. So a quick station break. My guest is Judith Curry. She's the president of climate forecast applications network. She's on Twitter at Curry J A, and you can find her on the web at judithcurry.com. 
you have a, a lot of traction on your blog, on your website. I mean, you're getting hundreds of comments. That's, I mean, even for a, a, a I would say a, a mainstream media outlet, that's a lot. Uh, uh, do you know how many hits or how many, how many uh, readers you have on your website? Um, I haven't checked lately, but uh, okay. It's in terms of unique visitors in a year. I haven't checked recently, but it would be, you know, like 500,000 maybe um, on a daily and you basis. And you don't carry advertising. You're not trying to make money off of your website as far as I can no, tell. No, I'm just, I'm just trying to have a diet, you know, the, you know, I, when I started this, I wanted to have a dialogue with people out with different perspectives. Okay. I just wanted to allow a forum for people to talk about the uncomfortable things that the establishment was trying to push under the rug. I mean, that's why I started it. The unintended consequence of this is that I have developed a network of people all over the world, um, academics outside, you know, like lawyers, economists, philosophers, you know, from many different social psychologists, a lot of social psychologists from all over the world who are interested in these alternative perspectives. Many of them contribute guest posts. And then I've, a lot of the people I've interacted are, are people with operational knowledge. And this would be like energy meteorologists and planning engineer. Um, and I will mention planning engineer specifically because it's so relevant to your show. Um, this is somebody who posted over the years has probably posted 40 blog guest posts on various aspects of energy transmission, the duck curve and renewables and on and on it goes. And who this is, this is Russ Schusler. He's the recently retired vice president of planning for the Georgia transmission corporation. Okay. When he started posting, he was anonymous. He did, he thought he would, you know, he didn't want anybody to know. He didn't want to get in trouble with his employers. Well, somehow he was outed and his employers just thought it was wonderful and wanted him to do more of this outreach writing, which he did. And then he's been retired for a few years. And after going off and having fun, I follow him on Facebook. He's been having a lot of fun. Um, he's back to writing posts on my blog again. And it's this kind of operational knowledge, you know, about people in the agricultural sector, farmers, hydrologists, you know, energy experts, and, and so on, um, which has been so valuable to me in trying to wrap my head around this whole thing. Um, there's a new term for what I'm trying to do. And I had a blog post on this a couple months back. It's called Wicked Science. <laughs> this is, you know, when you're dealing with a massively complex problem that you don't even really know how to define and it inter it has and it intersects with politics, you know, we have a wicked problem. I mean, people can't even agree on the problem, they can't agree on the solution. All of the proposed solutions have unintended consequences. And this is called a wicked problem. Well, some universities are starting to grapple with this. Well, how do we train people <laughs> to grapple with these problems, you know, rather than these silo disciplinary type people? And they call this wicked science and wicked scientists. And there's a couple of universities that are developing innovative programs where people work in teams, you know, and they challenge and they look at all the perspectives and they're interacting with stakeholders and decision makers and whatever. This is all the stuff that I've been doing with my company, you know, for the past 15 years. <laughs> so now I have a name for it. You know, it's and what I'm trying to do on my blog. It's wicked science. So well, I mean, well, now because I, you, you had a you had a blog entry about this just a couple of days ago, and it, it was the headline of the essay was JC navigates the new media. And I wanted to read this. You, uh, I'm quoting here, I like doing wicked science, where complex problems in politics intersect and public communication of the same. I am appalled at the state of both the scientific and policy debates surrounding climate change. I am hoping that my little voice can help bring some common sense to this situation. And I wrote right here, question, appalled? Appalled. <laughs> that's, the right, that's the right word. Appalled, yeah. <laughs> Because there's not, because it's not robust that there isn't uh, that, that there isn't, um, well, I'll, I'll say for instance, 
I've invited Bill McKibben to come on the podcast not three times, four times. He, he won't reply to my emails. I mean, I'm like, you know, he is getting a lot of media attention. I've debated him before. Well, then come on the podcast. I had Jesse. You're, in, you're in the wrong tribe. They don't want to debate. I mean, I, I didn't want to debate. I just I didn't. find out what his plan is because he's, you know, he was on PBS just the other night and it was getting more people involved in climate action. Okay. Well, I appreciate you want to get more people involved. What are you promoting? What is it that, what is your, because we can disagree about, uh, here's my view quickly. It was just, we can disagree about what that right number of parts per million in the atmosphere is. What are we going to do? Because we can talk about the science and the rest of it. What is our plan? And that to me is where, when you mentioned nuclear before, I want to come back to that. My, I've been saying the same thing for a dozen years, natural gas to nuclear. If we're serious, it's a no regret strategy going forward. What well, let's pursue that. But if he won't debate, then that I think that's won't answer. Then I think that's indicative of an unwillingness to an unfortunate one, an, an unwillingness to engage in any kind of substantive discussion. Forget debate, just discuss it. I mean, you know, but that's just no, they, 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 they don't want that. The, the whole list of people are blocked from Twitter, you know, by these. McKibben, Michael Mann, all these people. And some people said, oh, I've never heard of Michael Mann. I've never even done anything. You know, I went to look, see what he's doing on Twitter, and I'm blocked. How and why did that happen? I'm, I'm well, blocked. Well, he had this whole blackball list of people. He must have commented on what's up with that blog or something, and that's enough to get you blacklisted. These people don't want, you know, it, it's, it's, again, religious. You cannot challenge the dogma. And they're not interested in debating. They, they lose. A couple of them are interested in debating. Andy Dessler is a um, climate scientist at Texas A&M. Yeah. And he tries to gra grapple with aspects of the wickedness, and he's willing to debate. He goes out there and debates and cites, you know, Steve Kuhn and I don't know all who's debated with Andy Dust. Right. And, and Andy gets wiped out, <laughs> you know, but he's out there doing it. I give him a lot of credit for that. I do, too. But 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 the people like Steve Kuhn and Bjorn Lomberg and myself and, uh, and Alex Epstein and, uh, you know, a lot of these people, you know, it, it were pretty tough to take on in any kind of a debate. OK, because we're broadly knowledgeable and we're smart people. So you're not going to take us down, <laughs> you know, trivially. Now, in any kind, I'm not interested in winning a debate. I'm interested in talking to people on the other side, finding common ground and unraveling where we disagree, why we disagree, um, doing that sort of thing. I mean, that's my interest in this. I'm not interested in trying to win a debate. I'm trying to advance our understanding. And part of that is getting a better realization of where and why we disagree and where we overlap and how do we take this overlap of where we agree on something and take it forward to no regrets policy responses, something like that. So it's more of a problem solving approach. I mean, that's my interest in debating. So I'm not interested in these tribal kind of debates, although I'll take on anybody who wants to debate me. And let me tell you, nobody from that side will debate me. I mean, I, I leave that open. If anyone wants to debate me, bring it on, but nobody does. Um, and that's deeply unfortunate because I think these issues and um, they deserve robust analysis and robust mm -hmm. engagement. Um, but I want to talk about that because you also, uh, on that same uh, uh, blog post where you talked about navigating the new media, I thought this was a really an important point. You said, Twitter is the indispensable tool for wicked scientists. And that rang exactly true with me because on, <clears throat> oh, I don't know, it's a month or two ago now, I had Matt Ridley on and he's written a great new book called Viral about COVID. And uh, I know, I know. Matt is great. And, and just a remarkable uh, book of investigation. Well, he met his co-author, Alina Chan. I mean, Matt, of course, lives in the UK. And, and Alina's, I think, in Boston or in one of uh, MIT. Uh, but they met on Twitter. I mean, they they and began collaborating, wrote a yeah. book together. Never, never, they wrote a book together without ever meeting. And then they met after the book was finished. But Matt said the same thing, that but for Twitter, he would have not been aware of Alina's uh, work. They would have never begun their collaboration. And then they produced a remarkable book. And the new preface of it is and talking about what's happened in terms of COVID. Um, but so they went on to write a book together. But I, I'll just ask this is the question I put there. 
So Elon Musk is now, you know, opening the Twitter files. We've had all these revelations about who's been blocked and why, and all these internal messaging about, oh, we can't let them have a voice. Uh, do you like what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter? I, I am. I, I I couldn't be a bigger fan if I tried. <laughs> no kidding. Oh no, I think I think it's wonderful, and he, he's introducing a lot of chaos, and which isn't a bad thing as long as it doesn't actually break technically. So he's introducing a lot of chaos, but, but this is how innovators work. You know, they, they break it, they try new things, it doesn't work, they fix it, they get feedback, you know, all this stuff that he's doing and he's responding to people's suggestions. You know, I can see it online. Elon, why don't you try this? Good suggestion. I'll get one of my engineers started on this, you, you know, this kind of thing. Um, Th th this is how great innovators operate. And I see that in, you know, some people say, oh, this, all this chaos makes me nervous. <laughs> well, you know, well, welcome to the real world. I mean, what I see is a great innovator. And I mean, this whole, you know, some of the free speech issues that have been raised are tricky ones. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how that's going to be resolved. Um but we need to have a dialogue. And this goes way beyond Twitter. I mean, you know, this extends really to every aspect of what's going on, you know, in our society, our government, etc. So it raises a whole host of free speech issues that need to be confronted. But his basic instincts on this are absolutely right, in my opinion. Well, I think you, you make an important point in that in your recent blog post on the on the new media that that Twitter has become this insta in, in, indispensable that that if if you if we can't have a, a forum where you know you can be shouted down or you can be you know engage or debate or something you know I I engage rarely on that because I just don't have enough time in the day to debate everybody all the time right but I do see a lot of incredibly good content and I've a lot of people on my podcast I've met only because of Twitter and to me it's become a place where I can vet people and see what they're thinking and then I had Alexander Stahel who's a an investor in based in Switzerland and he's some incredibly sharp analysis on the electric grid in Europe and I had him on and He's just amazingly knowledgeable. And it's been one of the most popular podcasts we've done. And I, I want to have him back on again, because I think here's somebody who's just got an, just an amazing breadth of knowledge and understanding of how the grid is operating, who's short, who's long, and, and how it's all going to work. Um, so it, do you think you were shadow banned or that there were some limits on what your, oh, your yeah. reach oh, was yeah. on, on oh, Twitter? Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I... My early action on, actions on Twitter, I would post my blog posts, you know, cross post it on Twitter, and I would retweet a few things. I wasn't real active, yeah. Um, but I was, you know, building a slow follow. I mean, I would like thirty thousand followers, which is non-trivial, um, but it's not huge by sure. the standards of you know the big Twitter people. And whenever I I did tweet. I would get a lot of retweets. I would um, get a lot of likes. I would add a bunch of new users. Then for about two years, it was like I was tweeting into the void. You know, I would put tweets out there. I would get one or two kind of responses. And my followers, you know, all but stalled out. So, you know, a week after Elon Musk took over. Okay. Now I've increased my Twitter followers by almost 30%, you know, on the time scale of a month. No kidding. <laughs> which, is big, which is pretty big. Um, Matt Ridley made the same so, comment that he'd seen a big jump in the number of his, his followers since Musk. Right. And, and I get tons more replies, but most significantly is some people commented, he says, Oh, wow. I didn't realize Judith Curry was still on Twitter. I haven't seen any tweets from her in ages, you know, and these people were following me, but my tweets didn't show up. Okay. So, you know, in their feed, you know, if you search Judith right. Curry, you can right. find them, but they just weren't showing up on anybody's feed. So, you know, I'm, I'm small potatoes compared to, you know, some of the big people who were apparently shadow banned. And I look forward to seeing what Jay Bhattacharya, you know, the epidemiologist, what he unearths regarding 
you know, his, his situation. Almost certainly, I was shadow banned in some way. And there's a direct example with my YouTube, my recent YouTube video. Um, you mentioned that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, for, for me, I mean, this in, in a week's time, it went up to 500,000 views, you know, which is viral in my little world. Sure. And then all of a sudden you could not find it. You search Judith Curry, Judith climate, business, it, you could not find it. You know, it was just not findable. You know, it was buried, <laughs> I guess. And, this, it, and this was an interview you did with, which was the outlet? I, I don't recall. Uh, Biz, Biz News. It was an interviewer in South Africa. And uh -huh. it, it, you can still find it on the Biz News TV channel. But like if you search under my name or whatever, you know. It's you disappeared, know, so, from, it disappeared yeah, from YouTube. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, you mentioned Bhattacharya. I wanted to ask that about, uh, uh, I wrote this one question here about the, the role of experts. And the, uh, well, I wrote it this way. I said, there's all the furor around things like COVID and vaccines. And now, of course, we're talking about climate. And, and, and we talked about belief earlier. My question was, is, does this degrade the public's belief in experts and or institutions? Does it make, is, 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 do you think that this is, having an effect of making people more cynical and less trusting of anyone with a, any kind of authority? Is that, am I making too okay. broad of a question here? How do you see that? Well, okay. Here's the big issue. We have to go back to wicked problems. Okay. okay? If you take a wicked problem, climate change, COVID, <laughs> global pandemic, and you try to make it a tame one and control it, you have to come up with some specific information and some strategies to control. We have no idea what's going on. So the specific information that's being used is invariably going to turn out to be wrong. Okay, real expertise would be like Jay Bhattacharya. You know, we don't know. <laughs> you know, this is what we don't know. This is these are scenarios that could happen. Um, we're not going to be able to control this. Let's figure out what we can do to manage the most adverse impacts. And if people took that kind of approach to climate change and to COVID, I mean, then experts would have a real role to play in terms of figuring out how we can best manage this with, you know, by not causing even worse, you know, adverse impacts, you know, the, the cure worse than the disease kind of situation. Right. So the, the challenge, you know, two issues. I mean, Experts who want to control something that's uncontrollable, you're going to run into trouble every time. Experts in the university are very different from operational experts, people on the front lines treating COVID patients, people on the front lines trying to keep an electric utility operational. So there's an overemphasis on academic expertise in pursuit of control. This is where we get into trouble. And that the elites are having too much. Uh, I'm saying that, and I don't like to use that word, but it, it, but it is true. I mean, if you're in one of yeah. these elite academic institutions and you have tenure, you're pretty well insulated from a lot of bad things happening your, with your career. So, but am I reading? Oh, Jay Bhattacharya is a case in point where <laughs> he suffered. He, he was shadow by. He, I forget. Maybe at Stanford. I mean, he's he's. I, a I think that's right. I think he's at Stanford. And his, epidemiologist. Yeah. Yeah, and his career was extremely adversely affected by all that. Okay, so he's he's a case in point, and I don't know enough about that off the top of my head to give you a great deal of detail, but it's worth looking at. This is someone where the institution, the affiliation with an institution, and your reputation and publication or whatever, was not sufficient to insulate you. Right. I mean, the same with, you know, same with me in the climate so, circle. So we've talked, we've mentioned <clears throat> no regrets and I've put forward my, my ideas, which I've been putting, you know, very simple ones end to end natural gas to nuclear. I've been saying the same thing for more than a dozen years. What action should we be taking? And I know you're saying that you, you I would cat categorize you as a non-alarmist around climate change. I think that's fair to a fair assessment, isn't it? But what action should we be taking then if <clears throat> if climate is if climate change is in the longer term a, a real issue? What action should we be taking now? Okay, so if we look at the long term, like <clears throat> in the 22nd century, we're 
even independent of climate change, we're probably not going to be relying so much on fossil fuels. They're going to be more expensive to extract. There are the geopolitical issues and on and on it goes. Okay, so we need something better, not just to replace what we're currently doing with fossil fuels, but we need a lot more energy, and not just to fuel electric this and that and to power Africa, but we need electricity for all of the conceivable and currently inconceivable innovations that we want for the 21st, you know, robotic this, artificial intelligence, cyber that, um, quantum this, and new materials, and on and on it goes, we're going to need more electricity. And no matter how what we transition to or on what time scale, we're going to need a lot of fossil fuels to actually get us there. Right. So this idea of trying to kneecap fossil fuel production in the near term, thinking that this is going to <laughs> miraculously somehow provide us with cleaner energy, well, it's just going to provide us with inadequate energy, uh, intermittent energy, insufficient amounts of energy. Um, people, you know, in Sweden are being say, if you have an electric car you know, don't charge it. We don't have enough electricity to right. support your electric cars and on and on it goes. So this whole thing doesn't make sense. I, I am all in favor of modernizing our whole electricity, energy, transportation infrastructure to meet the needs and provide the infrastructure for opportunities in the 21st century for human advancement, for thriving. So I'm all in favor of doing something. I'm just saying, you know, we, we have to do something that's a lot better than what we have right now. <clears throat> and whatever we do, it's going to take a lot of fossil fuels to get us there. Right. Um, and like I said, big fan of the um, advanced nuclear technologies that are coming online. And I'm very enthusiastic about geothermal. Um, solar is a niche solution for households and right. whatever for personal energy security. I have to come up, you know, th this personal energy security issue is a huge one. People buying diesel um, tanks. Standby, standby generators, yeah. Standby is huge in California. The Obamas bought a 5,000 gallon tank to as backup for electricity at their house on Martha's Vineyard, right on the ocean, you know? So, you know, the people who have money will do this, <laughs> you know, even some climate advocates. I mean, like California is a very green sure. energy kind of place. And Obama is certainly an outspoken climate advocate person, but they've all got backup power. They're not relying on the the rank and file, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Generac sales, Generac sales are through the roof. I'm, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you're saying if I can para uh, paraphrase is that you're, you, what you're saying, what we should be doing or our, our best no regret strategy is to understand that we're going to need hydrocarbons for a, a long time to come. And then developing, you mentioned geothermal, but I've also heard you say advanced nuclear. So that oh, those uh, are the, those are the ways. Those are the ways forward, and we should. And, and I'm completely in, in agreement on all of that. I think that, it, especially nuclear, and I fear that the U.S. is going to, we're going to lose the the foreign countries are going to steal a march on us because we're just moving too slowly. But uh, that's yeah, we've got the best technology. But yeah. you know, like Russia is, is the one who's building nuclear power plants around the world. Yeah, China's we have the best building. technology and the worst regulation. <laughs> I, guess I, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I would put uh, it that so I'm way. hoping, I'm hoping that this can, you know, that will really take off in the U.S. The Department of Energy is putting a lot of money into this, which is really good. I see all these new technologies that are being tested and coming online, and it's enormously exciting. It's enormously exciting. So, you know, the, the, this is where it will be, you know. By 2100, this is almost certainly what it will look like. Nuclear, geothermal, hydro, um, including using hydro storage and uh, some household solar some, some, some wind, and microgrids. The other, I don't know if you've had anybody on your show talking about smart microgrids, but this is the other thing that I think is really, really exciting. Um, and one of the electric utilities companies that 
I work with is a leader in doing the microgrids where they can island, smart microgrids, this, that, and the other. So right. it's pretty exciting stuff. So you're a technical person. Quick question. What do you think about, there's a recent announcement about fusion. What do you, what's your take on that? Um, we'll see. Fair enough. That's been my, that's been my analysis. I mean, it's exciting if it works, but you know, I, I think, I think we should be in, in R and D mode on all these new technologies and, you know, start once they're ready for prime time, start testing them out in, you know, limited areas so we can develop a learning curve and drive the cost down and, and then it will slowly take off. Sure. Um, and yeah. you know, to the extent that the government is going to invest in infrastructure, energy infrastructure beyond what these scattered power providers and electric utilities do, um, that remains to be seen. Um, but, you know, like uh, giving a, a good electricity background for the U.S. is of hugely importance, not just for the economy and health and safety, but for national security. So, you know, we'll see. I mean, that's something to debate. You know, what role should the federal government play in ensuring this? But right now they're just, you know, President Biden is trying to kneecap the fossil fuel industry and push wind and solar. <laughs> this is hurting our economy, messing up our environment, and is going to people die from the cold. <laughs> you know, when when somebody can't provide heat, you know, they, they die from the cold, and then there's enormous property damage when the price pipes freeze, and on and on it goes. So, so it's just setting us up. For disaster, I'm, I'm politically an independent. I don't align myself with either party, but if the Democrats are going to persist in, in that, that's reason for me not to vote for Democrats. You know, mm -hmm. in the next elections. I mean, the, to me, this is such a foundation for disaster in our country. Well, yeah, I, I, on that, I, I have to agree with you because, uh, uh, it, yeah, this 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 administration, I'm, I'm the same way. I, as I say, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm disgusted and I am disgusted. But yeah, I, this this administration, that that's a longer discussion. So just a few more questions. And again, my guest is Judith Curry. She's the uh, uh, the uh, uh, a climatologist. You can find her on uh, Twitter at Curry J A and also on the web, judithcurry.com. Um, I know you mentioned some of the many people and you have many contributors to climate, et cetera, your blog, uh, but who else in this space, who, what other people who are active in this intersection of climate and policy and the, the actual physical world, whose work on this do you admire? Are you going to two or three names that you uh, would like to share? Well, people who have a foundation in climate science um, that have successfully bridged the gap into the policy and applications. Um, the list isn't real large. Um, people who have written <clears throat> popular books on the subject who I, I've i read and that I listen to, again, Steve Coonan, um, Bjorn Lomborg, um, Alex Epstein. I mean, these are Michael Schellenberger. Um, these are people who I pay attention to. Do I agree with everything they say? No, I don't. But I'm, I'm fairly unique in the space, in all honesty, with having like what you would call deep climate science expertise with a lot of publications and some um, recognition for what academic rec recognition for what I've done, who is really transitioned into the applied space, not just the policy world, right. but also the operational aspects of electric utilities, precision agriculture, things sure. like that, that, that I've really stepped into the operational aspects of it. So I honestly don't know of any other climate scientists with a profile like that, you know, on either side of the debate. Fair um, enough. We'll talk about policy, you know, and they get invited to testify to congressional committees, but I don't know that they actually do hardcore work in that area. There's people who, there's all these lawsuits, you know, people testifying sure. on one side or the other for these lawsuits, but I don't know. I'm fairly unique as far as I know. 
uh, have you, uh, in the pure wickedness of what I'm trying to do. Right. Um, so just the last couple of questions here, Judy, and I appreciate your time. Um, so we've talked about a lot of things. We covered a lot of ground. Um, what are you reading? Any books on your bookshelf, any books on your, on your desk that you're paying attention to? If so, what? Oh my gosh. I read so widely. Um, I'm actually delving into the, this whole children's psychology issue mm -hmm. and I'm reading um, a book on hardiness, psychological hardiness. Mm -hmm. One of the authors is Paul Bartone, which I think is providing me with a lot of insights into that. But I, I do so much technical reading, um, you know, the, the luxury of just like reading a book. Oh, okay. Okay. I've got two that I'm reading okay. and then I'll do, be doing a blog post. There's a new genre in cli-fi or climate related science fiction which i will call dystopian net zero books where, where these books are positioned five ten years in the future and all the horrible things that have you know happened because of you know net zero and so so i'm coining a new fiction genre dystopian net zero fiction and there's two books that have recently been published and I don't know if I'll get the titles right. Uh, I make a plug. Uh, I should have been prepared to make a plug for these, but there will be a, I will be writing on these two books mm. on my blog, probably by the weekend. So, so dystopian, that's fun. Uh, dystopian net zero. If we're going to really yeah. do this, how bad, it, how bad it will be. Yeah. Like well, what's going to happen, you know, further down the line, if we, proceed in this direction. One is set in 2026 and the other is set in 2032. Uh, the first one is more of a thriller kind of mm -hmm. thing. And the other one is more of a, you know, a day in the life or what's happening to real people kind of things. And they're both beautifully written mm. and very intriguing. So sounds a little <laughs> like uh, one second after by William Forsyth or something like that. The, uh, if we're hit by a solar flare or EMP or yeah, whatever. right. Except it's a slow creep and it's something that we decided. Right. Okay. <laughs> to drive ourselves in the ditch like the Europeans did. Yeah. Um, so last question, Judy, what gives you hope? What? What gives you hope? What gives me hope? Um, well, the environment is quite resilient. There's a lot of collective intelligence out there in the world. And I'm a techno optimist. You know, I think we can, <laughs> we can, we can fix these issues. We can make exciting things happen. So I'm a techno optimist. The environment is not as fragile as people think. And there's a lot of intelligence out there. Um, what worries me the most is what's going on with the kids with all this kind of brainwashing. But the other thing is, is another decade, I don't think we're going to see the climate proceed on the warming trajectory that's being predicted. I think there's a lot of other things going on in the climate you know, that are going to take us in a cool direction in the next couple of decades that at least partially counter this. So I think once we see a period with reduced extreme events, we, we see a period when the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation shifts to the cold phase, you know, some of these things are going to take the, the weather and climate in a slightly different direction that are going to be not as bad as predicted. So, so, I think we're going to be able to count on the climate itself and the weather events to calm this down a little bit at some point. So We've the, had a climate, the climate, if I'm going to read that back to you, the climate will cool the rhetoric. Yeah. It, it, you know, the, the rate of warming I anticipate will slow down relative to what they're predicting. Mm. And I think we've seen a particularly bad combination of natural climate variability Ability that's given us some bad extreme weather in the last five years. I think that'll settle down. So I think we can count on that to settle things down. And in all honesty, worrying about all this stuff is a luxury, you know, of rich countries. You know, once something really bad happens and the war in Ukraine is one thing, you know, people quickly forget about their <laughs> global warming pledges and all this, you know, as 
survival and more important political issues come to the forefront. So, I mean, I <laughs> while one doesn't hope for things like that to happen, um, if it does happen, I think this whole issue of climate change will move away from the forefront of what people are worried about. Gotcha. Well, listen, that's a good place to stop. My guest has been Judith Curry. Uh, she's easy to, find, easy to find on the interweb. She's on Twitter, Curry at, at CurryJA, and also JudithCurry.com. She's the president of Climate Forecast Applications Network. Judy, thanks for coming back on the Power Hungry Podcast. It's been great fun to talk to you. Okay, thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. And thanks to all you in podcast land. Tune in for the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Until then, see ya.